South Africa is four and a half hours, <laughs> correct? If I was living in Egypt, I mean, I mean, if I was going to Morocco, Casablanca, mm-hmm. from Nairobi, is if I'm lucky, it's twelve hours, yeah. correct? If I'm living Paris and I'm going to Brussels, if I'm going to Paris, I'm going to Malta. Average connectivity in Europe is three hours, maximum yeah. four. With five hours flight, you are ninety nine percent of Europe. In Africa, five hours, you're nowhere. Yeah. You need fifteen hours. And who is going to connect you? Either London, Paris, Brussels, Dubai. And those are the challenges we have to raise. So I would say that it's the territory is also very complex. So the view about Pan Africa, it's not about one bank in every country. It's about collective banks, correct? Working in the regions and then partnering. Like I am doing some partnership with Atjarwafa Bank, uh-huh, okay. correct? We signed an agreement for them for trade. Mm-hmm. So they are in. I think it's 16 countries or 17 countries. Yeah, correct. All across. In the West and, 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 and Central Africa, we are the largest bank in Eastern Africa. We signed a deal last last month in in Casablanca with that to be able to enhance trade, to do common businesses, mm-hmm. to support our customers who are importing and exporting. Mm. And naturally, the two of us can now connect 20 countries. Mm. You see, and yeah. that's that's how we see the Pan African linkages. Right. For, 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 it's for partnership. Bank. It's not over expansion. And it would not be real competition in yeah. this market. It's collaboration. You mentioned Ethiopia. Yes. Um, so your good friend Bob Collymore asked him the same question. Yes. He was like, until I see a way of getting money back to my shareholders sure. out of Ethiopia, sure. I, you know, I can't We're in really the same know. position today. So the greatest impediment for investment in Ethiopia today is that you have no free access of capital yeah. in and out. And until we are able to liberalize the currency and have cash available, because investors want to exit with cash. Yeah. So that remains a major concern. But today... It's, it's not changing anytime soon. I, I mean, I, I spoke to the Minister of uh, Trade, who's here, hmm. and asked this very question. Correct. And she said, well, it's very difficult right now with the, with the foreign exchange shortages, etc. So we can't think about liberalizing in the short term. But it's certainly a plan in the medium to long term. Well, you, yes. I just don't know what that means, medium term. Do you have any better sense? No, that? no, no, no. I, I think absolutely. I mean, we don't see. Because every single country wants to maintain its currency. It needs to make sure it has got enough reserves. And those reserves come in either through remittances or they come through exports. Mm-hmm. Or through a major industrialization of manufacturing, which initially does a huge impact on foreign foreign currency demand, which is what Ethiopia is going through. Yeah. So that's one area that we have a challenge. That it is it will be... We have to be able to invest in Ethiopia in Ethiopian standards. Yeah, it's not about internationalizing. So the laws today don't allow as a financial institution to invest. So a foreign bank just cannot get a license, All right? So that's one hurdle for us. We have to make sure that we can get that regulation. So that's one impediment. The second one, and I think that is a fatal one because without the regulation, then we can't get a license. We can enter the market. So I mean, Ethiopia is a rep office, not doing much really, just scratching right. around and waiting. Number two is about the foreign currency the exchange. Mm-hmm. How easy is it to move in capital into Ethiopian back? And those two are the greatest challenges. But let me say I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic that in the medium time it could be 10 years. Right. It could be 5 years. The African investment story is a long haul investment journey. Mm-hmm. It's not a sprint. We are well known for running marathons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And I put a metaphor that an investor who is successful on the continent must have taken a 5, 10, 20 year view. Mm. We take a 2, 3 year view. Is that why the private equity companies have all come across their hands? You had big, big private equity from America come, KKR, uh, Blackstone, and, they, and they've left. Well, I mean, they, take a, they took a... So if you're coming to the continent to take advantage of the short-term opportunity, and, and that I don't think will, will grow your business. No. You can take short-term advantages, but they're really short-term. And few people will make money. My of investors will lose money. Yeah. It's like that. Yeah. But if you want to take in a few years, I mean, like Talo. Talo is coming to do all exploration in the continent. Mm-hmm. They'll spend the last 10 years. Correct? Right? They may be lucky to get some oil fields. They have money to get in some kind of deposits. Same thing. Like banks. The banks which came in in the short-term window. And we're also seeing a rise of African giants in terms of investment. So I would say with you that uh, is there a way of accelerating the time it takes? 
for two things Africa must do. The ease of doing business. We must intentionally and very deliberately fight to make African markets easy to invest. Licensing, communications, visas, power access, infrastructure, skill base, those double tax agreements between countries, those are big problems. Now, only Rwanda and Mauritius in the last decade are the top 50. Yet, the people that need to make a dramatic shift in the investment strategy and philosophy is Africa. Yeah. We're the one in need of capital, right? We're one in need of investment. We have the resources. We have got the basic raw materials we export. So that's what I would say that perhaps one of the greatest outcomes of the Africa CEOs Forum is to build an integrated strategy for engaging governments yeah. in not all countries, but majority of the continent. Rwanda is already ahead. Mauritius is already ahead. We can learn from within. Mm. And if we can profile milestones to make African countries top 100, right? On the ease of doing business. What would be for you in Kenya, the three big doing business reforms that you would like to see, and you're not allowed to say the rate cap? Well, for the financial sector, generally, it's what happens to the economy. So infrastructure. So that's a big area. You're talking about the road network, the railway network, and access to power. This is one issue that we must. If we don't connect the markets, customers, even my small farmer who has the best coffee, coffee must go to the port. If we can't get the ports in two days, forget it. These are coffee beans. And assuming we are going to brand them and they ground coffee. Yeah. Ground coffee is instant, right? You need to be into the market in a period of seven days. If it takes me more time to leave Kigali to Mombasa than from Mombasa to, 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 to Middle East or to China, then we have a problem. So that's one area I would say. So, so it's, for the bank, the Red Cup is, the Red Cup isn't really the biggest. And I can answer questions with the Red Cup. That's not really, it's, I would say Red Cup is a conversation whose time has passed. We will need to address it. And, the, and I, I can have solutions on what banks can do. But in terms of such one change we need to make easy, there's a lot of barriers of moving intra-regional business and trade volumes within countries, even within ESC itself. Sure. Now, between Kenya and Tanzania. Correct. And even Kenya and Uganda. Yeah. Kenya. So those issues are to address. So, but I think that ESC, to be honest, Nikolai, is slightly ahead, except Tanzania. Now, if we think about the region, the continental free trade area, that's a major challenge for us. We need to make it easy to have access. So, so, do, so do infrastructure, and and then the third one is to improve the level of productivity for the manufacturing and business on the continent. Because I am trying to supply a product to Uganda, and if I, if if my quality is not good enough, the product is coming from China, the product is coming from Europe. There's no way you can doesn't no matter how access the, the how the boundaries disappear if you do not have the quality of the product. So customers in Uganda buy milk products from Europe. Why? They want the small milk for coffee, right? Mm. Right? They want to be guaranteed the quality of milk for chocolates, right? They want to make sure that the milk has got all the components you're looking for. If the Kenyan dairy farmer and process is not producing it, they want they want they want shop. So in Kenya we don't have a problem. We, we import very little. But DRC, Uganda, Rwanda, they import a lot of this stuff. Mm. So that's what I would say that the top three. And obviously, you have to deal with the skill issue because technology is a big revolution mm. that is happening in our markets. And with the fintechs that are happening, and that has a big impact on the financial sector. So we need to be able to make an investment. But I'm, but I'm happy that we, you are speaking about companies which are operating the Silicon Savannah. Yeah. We have some of the best talents. I can guarantee you, you haven't met some of the young coders and tech engineers. Mm. You could meet them and you assume you're sitting today in the middle of France, in Toulouse, or you're sitting in Singapore, in the fintech city, or Silicon Valley, today. Mm. Or you're in Shenzhen, in China. No, no doubt. Kenya has um, terrific codes. So if you can well, use them, yeah. we can then leapfrog the way we drive our business within our region. So mm. those four. Yeah. And you see the technology will address the banking sector challenges because beyond the red cap, we must learn to SMEs, small and medium enterprises. Yes. We must learn to agriculture. We need a transparent credit scoring model for customers. We need to stop piling customers on one price regime. Mm-hmm. If Nikolai is a good customer, give him the right price. So the innovation around transparency of pricing and risk-based pricing, 
So you can have individual interest rates tailored to Correct. the this is, tailored this to the credit history of the person is derived through the their dramatic in our economy in history. And the fintechs are already doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So if you that is one way of coming out of the red cap. By profiling different consumer, prof- uh, you know, credit scores, mm-hmm. making it transparent, and lending them at the price that matches their own behavior as customers. But the idea about lumping everybody into a badge, so we have two scores, good and bad. Right. Yeah? The bad is denied. The good is given the same price. As long as industry behaves in that model, we will never be out of the red cover. So... Have you started to develop these things? So we have started. So like for us as a large bank now, on our mobile lending platform that we have yep. with Safaricom, mm-hmm. we are now lending $100 million a month mm-hmm. on a differentiated you know, credit score. Mm-hmm. So we are not differentiating it today yet, but we're building the credit scores already. We are using the mobile data. We're using the transaction history. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and building a holistic customer profile. As that profile delivers a price, that price then is differentiated to each of the customers. So we are bringing transparency. So are you buying data sets from Safaricom? So now you will get, now we have a partnership with right. Safaricom. So that partnership enables us to share information and data. But Nicola, you're right. As we see this moving, the big data is going to be the next frontier where we'll either win our business or lose our customer. Yeah. And part of that will mean being intelligent enough to buy data, the right data that is enabling us to be able to profile our customers. So we're already seeing data vendors today. And I have no doubt that Safaricom yeah. or m specifically will be one of those vendors that will provide data for the industry. What about, and, and it's a question I asked Bob Correct. a few weeks ago, Correct. what about the trials in India, WhatsApp's doing to sending money? In, in WhatsApp? They're trialing tens of millions of Indians are using WhatsApp to send money to each other. Well, it's a huge disruption for the financial sector, definitely. I mean, you and Bob can, can go and find new work. Like, they, they'll come, they'll eat your market, sure. <laughs> Let me say that if there is a, an area where we can be globally today competitive when it comes to mobile lending, money transfer, and profiling our customers is in Kenya. India is learning from us. And I am not surprised that if we don't create the model... But India has an ID card. Yes. Biometric ID card that everyone has now. Correct. It has its teething problems. Correct. Kids can't go to school because they're not on the system. Correct. It's got a lot of teething problems. Correct. But at its heart, it's, I, I guess, quite a useful tool. Kenya doesn't have it today. Well, but we are coming up with a national uh, integrated identity management system. It's right. fully biometric. Right. It's running to be ready this year. Mm-hmm. So, and, and we are not as big as India. So, with almost sure. 45, 50 Easier. million people, Easier we should be able to profile. Yeah. And that information will then be integrated to all platforms, whether it's mobile, whether it's digital, whether it's agency, whatever it is. There's one source of truth. So, what they call the NIMS, the National Identity, Created Identity Management System, is actually fully biometric for the country. And that gives me a lot of confidence about where Kenya is going. Mm. But I am also very clear that unless we are always innovating around lending and payments, as institutions, either banks or telcos, yeah. our business will be disrupted any day by somebody else that is sitting either in India or anywhere in the world. And that's for me, because yeah. the customer doesn't care today whether it's getting a lending product from a bank. That's what we see today. What we see is a customer wants a service, yeah. wants to buy a product, wants to sell a transaction. And so we've innovated, and if you've asked uh, with Safaricom, a product called Fuliza. Mm. It's a new product today yeah. that lends a customer on his mobile wallet. Mm. So if Nicola is in a shop wants to get some coffee in a Starbucks or in a Java and you don't have money in a wallet, you're able to get the limits. And that almost overdraw, instantaneous overdraw or overdraft as we call it, gives you cash. The customer don't know that money came from a bank. They settle, the money is with the merchant, the merchant then moves the money back to the bank and that continuous loop. Yeah, I think this is the next billion dollar business mm-hmm. that is going to be created in the future and that's where we must invest in. The um, space that Kenya has to borrow as a country is limited mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the government tells me. Correct. Um, the lending that was taken on to build the railway Correct. The, the euro bond from a few years ago which Correct. No one can really trace the proceeds of. Correct. There are there are 
um, you know, there are issues, macroeconomic issues.